Note, this video requires familiarity with the curved Dirac equation and its derivation, as well as a standard derivation of Yang-Mills theory, where we start with the Dirac equation, upgrade it to a global SUN invariance, and then make that local with covariant derivatives, commute the covariant derivatives to get the field strength tensor, and then look for an action made out of that gauge covariant field strength tensor that is invariant under the gauge transformation and has second order equations of motion. I have actually made a video on the tetradic Palatini formulation of general relativity in the past and there's no factual error with that video, but I watched it again recently, and I think I can improve the quality quite a bit. I think I can explain it better. I think I can explain it more clearly. I think I can present in a more pleasant to watch way, and so I'm going to make a new version of the video. I've never done this before. I've never replaced a video that didn't have a factual error in it, and the way I'm gonna do this is a bit differently. I'm not gonna take down the old video, I'm just gonna put old version in it, and then I'll put a link to the new one in the description of that video. Then I'll put new version in the title of this one. When in the past there has been the occasion that I've had to replace a video that actually had a factual error in it, I actually privated the old video so that there wasn't a video with a factual error in it on that topic floating around ready to confuse people. But here, because there isn't a factual error, it's just an effort to improve quality. I'm not going to private the old video, I'm just going to do that whole old version, new version thing. So here follows the math section. In my video titled, Sticking Spinners in General Relativity, the ultimate result that we got was this. We have the generally covariant Dirac action here, and we've got the kinetic term for the gravitational field, the Einstein-Hilbert action there. Our goal is to derive the tetradic palatini formulation of this Einstein-Hilbert action in a particularly instructive way. Of course, we could just stick the formula for the curves metric in terms of the tetrad in here and get it and be done with it, but that isn't very instructive. We're going to derive it using the technique that's usually used to derive QCD. The only difference there will be is that the symmetry group is not SU3, it's GL4. We're going to prove, basically, that you can derive a formulation of general relativity, specifically the tetradic palatini formulation, just like QCD, where all you have is a different symmetry group. The idea being to inform you of the fact that fundamentally the only truly meaningful difference between general relativity and other gauge theories is that we're using a different gauge group. Of course the theories look very different and that's mostly due to the fact that the different gauge group we're using is also the space-time symmetry group and that yields a lot of weirdness. But fundamentally the idea here is to help you realize the fact that general relativity really can be derived just like any other gauge theory, that we can just derive it, say, like quantum chromodynamics. And while this derivation is more complicated than other ways of deriving the tetradic palatini formulation, it's so instructive, it's basically senseless to do it any other way, even if those ways are easier. When we were deriving quantum chromodynamics, which I've also addressed in a previous video, we started with a gauge invariant version of the Dirac Lagrangian, specifically one invariant under the desired gauge transformation. And then we took the covariant derivatives that were required to make it gauge invariant and we commuted them to get a field strength tensor. And then we looked for an action with no more than second order equations of motion that was invariant under that gauge transformation as well. And we're going to show you can do that to get general relativity too if you start with the Dirac action that's generally covariant instead of SU3 gauge invariant. In a previous video, we already got the generally covariant Dirac Lagrangian, just this, and we already knew what the Einstein Hilbert action was, so we just added that on. But here our goal is to derive it in this intuitive way. So we're going to forget that we already know what it is in one form and derive an alternative gravitational kinetic term using this QCD-inspired technique. From there, we can show that the action we get for the gravity field really is just the Einstein-Hilbert action, because the requirements that it must satisfy, that the equations of motion have no higher than second-order derivatives, and that the action be generally covariant, we already know is uniquely satisfied by the Einstein-Hilbert action. So if this makes any sense, it should be equal, and we will show that it is. So now let's carry out this QCD-inspired program. We've got the gauge invariant Dirac Lagrangian. Let's now commute the gauge covariant derivatives and see what we get. We find this result after some pretty simple and not terribly long algebra, where this omega tensor 
is this formula here. Now our first guess as to how to construct a desired action for the tetrad field from this curvature tensor might be to square it because that's how it works in QCD and most Yang-Mills theories, but this turns out to be the wrong idea. If we square this we'll actually get equations of motion with derivatives that are too high order. You can see that actually the correct thing to do would be to contract these indices in order to get a scalar that can then serve as the basis for an appropriate action. Of course, whatever scalar we do construct, we're going to need to multiply it by the determinant of the tetrad to make sure that it transforms as a scalar density and that the action is therefore generally covariant. We can see that just contracting these indices with the tetrad to yield a scalar will yield second order equations in motion because in this omega tensor we see first order derivatives of the spin connection and in the spin connection formula up here we see first order derivatives of the tetrad. This seems like the only thing to do. So our guess is that the proper action for the gravity field is like this. This clearly is generally covariant and as we discussed it has second order equations in motion for the tetrad and we also know that the Einstein-Hilbert action is the unique solution to these requirements at least in four dimensions. So our guess is that this isn't just the only sensible action for a theory with this result for the commutator of gauge covariant derivatives, but our guess is that this is equal to the Einstein-Hilbert action. If we prove this, we will therefore have shown that general relativity can be derived in the same way that we derived QCD in that previous video, and that QCD is usually derived. It turns out that this isn't actually hard to do. All we need to do is develop a better understanding of this omega tensor. In short, the question we need to answer is what is the meaning of this omega tensor? It turns out that it is really closely related to the Riemann curvature tensor, and as a result it's quite easy to prove that this action we've derived based on it really is just the Einstein-Hilbert action. This isn't really surprising given that it resulted from commuting generally covariant derivatives. The goal then is to figure out what this relationship is. The first step towards figuring this out is to recall the form of the covariant derivatives when applied to various fields. This is the complete list of them. These are of fields with purely one type of index, and then we have combinations of different types of indices down here. These are the basic types, these are ones that follow from this. Above we evaluated the commutator of the tangent space spinner covariant derivative, and the curved vector covariant derivative famously just yields the Riemann curvature tensor when commuted right here. So of the three basic types of covariant derivatives, this only leaves one type of covariant derivative unexplored and that is the covariant derivative of a tangent space vector. It turns out that this commutator is the key to finding the relationship between this and that. So to be absolutely clear, the only reason why I'm bothering to evaluate this commutator is because it's necessary to develop that deeper understanding of this, specifically its relationship between this and that. And this is ultimately required, if you remember, to prove that the action we got from the generally covariant Dirac theory QCD style analysis is in fact equal to the Einstein-Hilbert action. So evaluating the commutator, if we simply write it out, we arrive here and very simple and short algebra ultimately results in it simplifying down to this. The two reasons why we can use this to relate the omega tensor to the Riemann curvature tensor is because we understand the relationship between curved vectors and flat vectors and this commutator also yields the same omega tensor. So yeah, this commutator yields exactly the same curvature tensor as in the spinner case. Only a few more manipulations are required to show its relationship with the Riemann curvature tensor. If we remember that the Riemann curvature tensor contracted with the curved vector field can be written as this commutator of covariant derivatives applied to it. We see that from above, I gave that relation, then we can do something interesting. We can take this curved vector field and relate it to its associated flat vector field by shifting the index with this tetrad. And the tetrad is covariant constant, so we can bring it out. And we remember that this thing, this commutator applied to a flat vector field, as we saw right here, just equals this. So then we have this relationship. Then we can shift this flat vector index to a curved one to get this relation right here. And then we can drop the A vector to get the relationship directly between the Riemann curvature tensor and this omega tensor. So we have the final key relationship that allows for the tetradic Palatini formulation of general relativity. Specifically, it allows us to prove that the action we got from our QCD style analysis of the generally covariant Dirac equation just yields 
the Einstein-Hilbert action, we can do this in the following way. If we take the Einstein-Hilbert action and plug this value in for the Riemann curvature tensor, and then write that square root of negative determinant of the metric prefactor in terms of the tetrad, then we arrive at this. The key here is that commuting the gauge covariant derivatives of spinners that allowed for the construction of the curved Dirac equation, and then constructing the only sensible action we could out of it, yielded this exact tetradic action. So we have shown that we, in fact, can derive GR, like QCD, simply by replacing the SU3 gauge group with GL4. Also, because we originally obtained the generally covariant Dirac theory by gauging the Lorentz group in a different video, we can say that GR can be derived by gauging the Lorentz group. So now you've seen how you can do a derivation of general relativity that is basically the same as the derivation of quantum chromodynamics. You start with a modified version of the Dirac equation, which contains the gauge invariance you're looking for, and then you take the covariant derivatives you had to use to make it gauge invariant to get a tensor. And then you take that tensor that was yielded by the commutator of covariant derivatives, and you start looking for an action that involves it that's gauge invariant and has no more than second order equations of motion. We saw that that worked here because we could show that it in fact is just the Einstein-Hilbert action. We already know that's the unique answer, so if this technique was to work, it would have to yield it. We had to do a bit of a trick to show that it was equal easily. Specifically, we had to take a commutator of covariant derivatives on tangent space Lorentz vectors in order to show the relationships between all the curvature tensors required to show that the tetradic action yielded by the Dirac spinner covariant derivatives really is just the Einstein-Hilbert action, but still we were able to do it. It's something that proved doable. So I hope this helped you understand this. I hope it was easier to understand and more interesting to watch than my first video on the topic. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. D-Trick out.